Thank you. We are going to record this session. Um, my name is Remy Shergal. I'm from the Climate and Health Alliance. Uh, before we do anything else, um, I would like to acknowledge that I'm calling in today from the lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation in so-called Melbourne or Nam. Um, I would like to pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging and acknowledge that this land has never been ceded and always was and always will be Aboriginal land. Um, at the Climate and Health Alliance, we recognise Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people as the traditional custodians of the land on which we all live and work and acknowledge that the land that we call Australia has never been ceded and we commit to listening and to learning from Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people about how we can better reflect Indigenous ways of knowing in our work. Um, thank you so much for joining us here tonight. Um, I am I'm Remy Shergill. I am the Campaigns and Comms Manager at the Climate and Health Alliance. Um, CAHA is an alliance made up of 100 health or almost 100 health and medical organisations um, and uh, who all want serious climate action and adequate climate policies uh, to protect our health because climate change is the biggest health crisis of the 21st century according to the World Health Organisation. Um, I'd like to thank our project partners for this event are the Queensland Centre for Mental Health Research and the Australian Psychological Society. Um, it's been fantastic working on this. Um, as well, everyone here is aware that the event moved online. I really hope there's no one um, sort of walking around UQ trying to find us. Um, we had to move this event online because it was supposed to be held live in Brisbane. Uh, but it is raining torrentially um, and we made the decision this morning that there, were, there was a risk of flash flooding and um, we wanted to minimise risk to attendees. Um, so we're here because of the rain. I can't say that uh, climate change made us uh, switch to online because that would require an attribution study. But what I can say is that climate change is making short and heavy rainfall events more frequent um, and more intense. What I can say is that for every one degree of warming, uh, there's 7% more moisture that can be held in the air so that when it does rain, more comes out. And I can say that when I was talking to people about whether or not to move this event online, what they said was one of the reasons that flash flooding is likely is because the ground is so sodden because the waterways are in Brisbane and around Brisbane are so full because of the record-breaking rain in the last few months, all of which took place in a warmer, um, in a warmer climate. So uh, it's happening right now, and, and we've heard from people who have said, we don't know what this rainfall event will look like, but we feel anxious or we feel scared about what will happen because we know what can happen because of the floods a couple of months ago. So... This topic is very salient. Um, it's also a topic very close to my heart. Uh, I can say without a doubt that eco-anxiety really drove me into climate action. Um, I've always been very interested in science and I thought I would work in research, um, but I couldn't stomach how abundant the evidence was for climate, that climate change was happening um, it, the science was so unequivocal, yet nothing was getting done, and I wanted to be part of that, part of the people trying to get it done. And, and I know that um, I've gone through many different phases of my own mental health in regards to climate change. I have, you know, cried over the picture of the polar bear on the tiny bit of ice. Uh, it breaks my heart. But the thing that has helped me is working on the problem, surrounding myself with other people who get it, uh, hopefully all of you, and being able to talk about it openly and without shame. So we'll jump right into it. Um, housekeeping, just keep yourself on mute. If you've got questions, put them in the chat. Um, it would also be great if everyone on here could introduce themselves in the chat um, and let us know uh, what you do and uh, what land you're calling in from today. Um, and then we'll be hearing from Fiona Charlson. Um, I also wanna flag that if the content of this webinar um, raises any issues for you there are places to get assistance and um, thank you 
the Hala, who just popped that in the chat. Um, we'll be posting those throughout the event. So our first speaker is Fiona Charlson. Um, Associate Professor Fiona Charlson is Principal Research Fellow at the Queensland Centre of Mental Health Research and the UQ School of Public Health. She works as a psychiatric... Oh, sorry, I'll just ask someone to put themselves on mute. Thank you. Um, she works as a psychiatric epidemiologist and health services researcher and is at the leading edge of research into the mental health impacts of climate change. Um, I'd like to pass over to Fiona to introduce the evidence, evidence base around this important issue. Thanks, Remy. Uh, just take a second here to share my slides. Okay, are we good? Just, yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Okay. So, um, yeah, thanks, Remy, and thanks for the invitation tonight. Um, I really thought. Being a researcher in this space, I work 100% on the mental health impacts of climate change now. Um, I thought I'd present, provide a bit of a, an overview of what we know, probably what we don't know, um, in terms of the evidence, and just kind of set the scene for some really thoughtful um, discussion among the rest of the panellists tonight, which I'm really looking forward to. So what we know is that the links between mental health and climate change are really complex. We might, um, if, we, if we think about um, bushfires, for example, we might relate bushfires to direct trauma from loss of life or loss of home, etc. That's quite an easy link to draw. But in fact, it's a very, very complex system um, that is much more far reaching beyond those very direct lineal impacts. And I don't want to dwell on this picture, but it's just an example of how um, detailed and complex this system of mental health and um, exposure to um, extreme weather events, climate change, environmental change, whatever we want to call it. Uh, uh. So just to sort of outline that and sort of maybe simplify it, we tend to think in the, um, in the planetary health space, we try and um, frame these impacts as primary, secondary and tertiary. So the primary ones are the direct ones, which are um, the direct impacts on, in this case, mental health related to um, heat, rainfall, humidity, fires, floods, storms, such as cyclones. We know that those particular weather events uh, have a, a very real and very direct um, uh, line of impact to um, people's mental health. Then we get um, kind of a little bit more um, indirect where the pathways, you know, there might be other things along the pathway um, between a particular event and the mental health impact. And these things are um, drought, sea level rise. So if you think of sea level rise, sea level rise itself doesn't cause mental health issues. Sea level rise leads to inundation of homes, forced migration, loss of connection to land, which then has impacts on, um, on uh, mental health. Other examples are land degradation, air pollution, physical health has a very strong um, uh, connection with mental health and physical health is impacted by, by climate change, as we know. And also thinking about water and food security and how those impacts, um, which are... Um, are exaggerated um, or exacerbated, sorry, by climate change, uh, have impacts on, on mental health. And then we kind of get to these really kind of broad systemic societal um, impacts, which are these things around displacement and migration, loss of connection to land, really kind of social and economic and sometimes political um, uh, issues which are exacerbated or brought about by, by climate change and then result on um, mental health, things like reduced economic productivity, um, reduced financial security, strain on community cohesion and social capital is a really big one that a lot of research is being done in that space, loss of our natural world, loss of nature spaces and conflict and political instability and that is definitely not an exhaustive list. 
So I just want to do a quick case study of heat because heat is, um, as identified by the most recent IPCC regional report, is a particular vulnerability for Australia. So the global warming average at the moment, I think, is 1.07 degrees. Someone might correct me on that. Australia is already at 1.4. Heat is a big, big issue in this country and other countries like we're seeing overseas in the um, India and Pakistan at the moment, but it's huge for Australia. And the mental health impacts of heat are really significant and potentially will have more of an impact um, than, than, uh, than um, other events such as floods, fires, cyclones and droughts. We know that uh, mental health emergency department presentations go up during hot days. We know we see increases in self-harm and suicide rates, increases in um, psychiatric related mortality. Um, these have all got evidence behind them from using Australian data. We also know that certain psychotropic medications, including um, antipsychotics, um, place people at an increased risk of heat stroke and death as a result of high temperatures. Um, and also heat increases vulnerability to brain toxicity related to substance use. So this is a really serious issue for us here in Australia. If we look at the spectrum of mental health impacts, we've got a whole broad spectrum of, um, of um, men mental conditions. And they sort of range from these subclinical conditions that we commonly term psych psychological distress. People are, are psychologically distressed, um, but they might not meet that threshold for a clinical disorder, such as PTSD, depression, anxiety, self-harm, or suicide. Then we've got this group, which I think we're going to talk a bit about tonight, so we won't dwell on, but these are environmental and climate specific constructs, which are climate anxiety, solar nostalgia, eco grief, those terms will be um, probably raised a bit tonight. Then we've got exacerbation of pre-existing illness, um, an example I just gave before of people on, on antipsychotics who are um, more vulnerable to heat, for example. We are also seeing impacts in terms of hospitalizations and deaths, which is psychiatric related, and I've mentioned that as well. And there's also this question mark around potential of, um, for neurodevelopmental impacts. We know that there are a number of environmental exposures which will be exacerbated by climate change that do have um, uh, do impact the um, neurodevelopmental uh, or the development of the brain during either in utero or of, of the young um, um, during childhood. So there's no specific research in that area yet, um, but it's very plausible to think that there, there could be impacts there. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but this is just to highlight this um, climate anxiety is a very real thing that a lot of research is, is going into. Um, it's considered that um, uh, a normal um, uh, response, but sometimes it can result in what we could call a maladaptive um, um, uh, manifestation, which leads to chronic, chronic worry, restlessness, and um, kind of impacts on people's functioning, unlike what Remy um, beautifully highlighted at the beginning, where um, there could be an adaptive response which, response, which motivates people to become involved in climate action. Um, yeah, I won't spend much time on that. So who's being impacted? Everyone's being impacted. Um, but there are, in the research at least, some priority populations that we should be paying particular attention to. These are our young people, children and adolescents, those with pre-existing mental illness, our Indigenous population in particular. We need to do more research on our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander populations here in Australia, for sure. Um, a lot of low and middle income countries who are already um, vulnerable in, in a number of two, I guess, um, disparities in, in health outcomes now being um, particularly vulnerable to the impacts of climate change and also our small small island developing states such as our Pacific neighbours and immediately our mind goes to the um, level rises. And another group that's really sort of um, being studied quite a lot at the moment are farmers because uh, they're um, 
struggles with climate change are really quite unique and, and um, uh, I would say being very strongly felt. So just very quickly, because I know that not everyone here is particularly interested in research, but I just wanted to highlight that of the small amount, relatively small amount of research in the mental health climate change space, more than 80% of it explores this kind of um, qualitative or quantitative um, impact of climate change. So saying, yes, we know it's quite well established that climate change does um, impact mental health. But what we really don't understand are which factors increase or um, the vulnerability or the resilience to these impacts. And we also have virtually zero research related to intervention. What are the solutions here? What are the policies that we should be designing to, to safeguard mental health? Um, and this is really important research that needs to be done. And um, my research group at um, UQ has really, um, we've kind of mandated ourselves to try and address some of these um, really critical questions that will help decision makers to understand the evidence and work out what the mitigation and adaptation policies and strategies should be. Um, just finally, I just wanted to flag if anyone is interested in research and is kind of wondering what they should do in terms of investing time, resources, money, um, what could they do within, within their group. We did a research priorities paper, um, which is here on the screen. I won't spend time on it. Um, because of time, but it is a very useful, I think, priority setting exercise. Thanks, back to you, Remy. Thank you, Fiona. Um, thank you for that overview of the evidence base, um, and that's going to set us up really well for the rest of this conversation, which is largely going to be talking to people um, who have experienced that, um, taking it from the research and seeing how it's relevant here, uh, well, particularly in Brisbane where we plan to hold the event, but a lot of this is relevant um, beyond. And speaking of which, uh, the first person uh, that will be speaking to us today is from the Tiwi Islands. I would like to introduce Susan Mankara. Uh, Susan is a First Nations woman from the Tiwi Islands um, and she comes from the Warrantatinga clan, which means the Sun clan. She is an Indigenous health researcher in her final year studying public health. She is passionate about First Nations health and climate change and ensuring that First Nations people are consulted properly and respected as the original caretakers and knowledge holders on this land. Um, thank you so much for joining us here today, Suzanne. That's okay. Thank you so much for that lovely introduction. <laughs> uh, thank you. Yes. So, as I mentioned, Suzanne, you're from the Tiwi Islands. Um, Santos is trying to open up a new gas field just north of the Tiwi Islands. How is this fossil fuel project affecting the well-being of your community? Um, I think similar to a lot of the issues that um, Fiona just raised recently, I think um, the main feeling is confusion, overwhelm and anxiety. Um, I think mainly initially because a lot of the community weren't consulted with properly during this process and I think you know we're just really concerned about our future you know there's so many pre-existing health and well-being conditions that are affecting our communities and the impacts of this project will have severe and irreversible impacts on our health country and culture so the initial impacts will affect our health and well-being immensely, you know, because we are a part of the land and not separate to it. Our people are strongly connected to our land and rely on it for medicine, ingredi, which is food and healing. We have our own seasonal calendar that shows us the correct times to harvest certain foods and indicates the behaviours of animals and when the best time is for hunting. Climate change in with increasing temperatures will only worsen our ability to practice our culture and decreasing the availability of traditional foods and resources. To our people, to our people sea turtle and dugong, our culture is significant uh, for food and medicine and the impacts of Santos, Santos's filling plants 
pose a major threat to these already endangered animals and our livelihood. You know, it's a fundamental human right to have access to our country and to practice our culture and to ensure that we have this for generations to come. So. Thank you for sharing, Suzanne. Um, really important that we know about this project and how it's affect, affecting people in the Tewi Islands. And I just want to say to everyone on the chat, um, we will be sending a wrap-up email tomorrow and we'll be including some information on this project and what you can do um, to support traditional owners from the Tewi Islands uh, to stand up to, you know, the massive fossil fuel industry. Just um, in case nobody knows as well, I'm sorry, I probably should have provided a bit of an overview. So the Tiwi Islands is located about 80 k's north of Darwin in the Northern Territory. There's two, two islands, um, Melbourne Island, which is the largest, and Bacchus Island, which is the smallest. And my traditional country is Jugalaru, which is the east, western tip, western point of the islands. And that's where um, Santos's proposed drilling plans will be affecting the most. So our coastal waters will be the first um, affected by the plans. And I think that's why we're so passionate about it because, you know, our, our health is dependent on the health of our country as well. So it's quite concerning considering the, the impacts of, um, of, yeah, of the plans. So it's really, really scary for us. Thanks, Suzanne. Really appreciate you sharing that. Um, we will hear from Suzanne a bit more later, but for now, I'm going to introduce our next speaker, um, Jessica Kinder. Jessica is a conservation ecologist and policy maker. She is passionate about engaging with youth communities and First Nations peoples to restore and conserve our unique Australian ecosystems. Uh, she's worked on a range of major Queensland government uh, environmental policies, um, and she has also released uh, the a community ecosystem restoration program through the Jane Goodall Institute Australia called Embrace the Wild. I'm a big Jane Goodall fan, so it's wonderful to meet you, um, Jessica. Um, I can imagine in your field of work that you often see the negative impacts of fossil fuels and climate change on Australian ecosystems and abroad. Um, how, how does that make you feel, and what impact does that have on your well-being? Well, that's a really interesting question, I think, Remy, because until recently, I think that those impacts on our ecosystems were not particularly evident. Um, these ecosystems are so complex, our wildlife is so um, complex, and actually being able to observe how climate change was impacting them was something that was really only achievable through modelling. Um, and I remember growing up that there was a huge amount of community denial about what climate change would actually do to our ecosystems and our threatened plants and animals. And one thing that I've observed in the last few years is that we are starting to see those impacts realised in very major and devastating ways. The Great Barrier Reef has had the sixth mass extinction recently this year. There were the 2019 bushfires, which everyone will recall vividly the horrifying pictures of wildlife impacted in those fires. And as a result, um, iconic Australian wildlife, like the koala, for example, have actually increased their listing um, in a very short period of 10 years. The koala has been uplisted from a vulnerable to an endangered species, which is an incredible impact. So I guess reflecting on that, there's some positive to be had from um, communities and your average Australian, I think, being able to acknowledge and realise and see that this is impacting our biodiversity um, as well as our communities. But I think there is a lot of um, anxiety and grief that comes with actually observing these losses and particularly for people responding on the ground to those injured wildlife, for example. Um, I think Fiona touched on it really well that sometimes this can be a traumatic experience. Um, it's very similar to first responders to car accidents and things like that. So there's very real impacts. And for me um, and for many conservationists who have just this huge amount of empathy for these problems, it can be really overwhelming and we can put a lot of pressure on ourselves to actually try and make a difference for these huge problems. Um, and I certainly have 
uh, experienced mental health issues, anxiety, depression as a result of my knowledge of these problems. Um, and I put a lot of pressure on myself to do everything to uh, try very hard in my job to um, reduce waste, to eat, um, you know, eco-friendly products, to just the list goes on and on about everything we can do. And so I think it's very easy to become burnt out. And um, I've definitely experienced that. And I, from what I have spoken to, everyone in this field is very aware of those kind of impacts as well. Thanks, Jessica. Um... Yeah, I could, I'm sure many of us can relate to that uh, feeling that we have to do every single little thing possible in our own personal lives, um, I guess, to make us maybe feel less guilty. Um, the good news is for people on here, we will be hearing from a psychologist about um, that exact coping strategy and how we can maybe reframe our thinking so that we don't feel as guilty. Um, thank you for sharing, Jessica. I'm going to throw now to our next speaker, um, who is Dai Tucker with us. Dai is a registered psychologist and a clinical neuropsychotherapist. She has broad experience with adults, children, young people and families. Um, working with them. Sorry, I think I missed a word there. Um, in the past six years, though, Dai has become more and more focused on climate um, and is now a, an active climate activist um, and she supports her clients and her fellow activists in the experience of ecological grief and anxiety. Um, so Di, great to have you here. Um, you've practiced across Brisbane. Um, are you, as a, as a um, when you practice, uh, are you seeing the impacts of climate change in your work? Yeah, thank you, Remy. Um, Jessica's experience feels so familiar. Thank you for sharing that. Definitely, I'm hearing people speak about deep concerns for the future and all of the anxiety and sadness and grief and helplessness that comes with so much of that, um, the growing awareness of where we are in the ecological crisis. I think most of the population now is becoming aware of it. And um, speaking to other therapists too, there's, I think, you know, there's many people who come in to therapy who are so preoccupied with the trauma that they've gone through and have experienced in the, in the recent floods and even the vicarious traumatization of what's happened in Lismore, that um, it's really easy to overlook the fact that it is climate related unless you dig a little bit deeper and you ask people questions about what their experience has been. But there's a lot of young people who are saying um, that they've already made that decision not to have children, even as young as 16. And for reasons that have been expressed already here today, because the future feels so uncertain and so frightening to bring a child into this feels impossible, overwhelming. And then along with that, there's, there's grief for the future that um, you thought you would have as a young person or for parents who feel that their children can't have children. I guess I see a lot of adult, older adults too who are really petrified for the future of their grandchildren and feeling guilty because they can't, they can't help. And also we feel partly responsible, well, responsible for this problem as well. Um, I think the research mentioned people with pre-existing mental health conditions. Definitely. I spoke to someone this afternoon who was flooded earlier this year in her house here, and she hasn't been able to get back to baseline. And then today's rain has really, really distressed her again. So that's a real, that's a real struggle. Um, there's also a lot of stress on relationships. Um, because climate change has been so politicised, there's a lot of families where family members just cannot, they cannot get on the same page. They're being alienated from each other because they hold such extreme views. Going to see the parents who are watching Sky News and then denigrating the child for having these alternative um, but factual views of what's going on. And I worked with a couple um, who 
one of the couple wanted to take their child back to the family of origin because they felt so unsafe in this country of Australia because it was becoming so dangerous that that, that person, excuse me, and the couple felt the only way they could, they could keep the child safe was to leave this country. And that put a lot of stress and pressure on that relationship. So, yeah, we're definitely seeing it in the therapy room. Thanks for sharing, Di. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's powerful stuff. And I just want to assure everyone at this point, we are going to get to the mm. bit where we talk about how to feel better um, <laughs> because it can be um, confronting, but it's a really important experience to um, highlight that people are feeling this way and it's, it's, it's really hard. Um, last but not least, I'm going to introduce our, our last panellists um, together. Um, with us today, we've got Declan and Layla. Um, they are 16 and 15 respectively, and they're both organisers for School Strike for Climate, uh, that, that wonderful movement of young people, um, many of them not 18 yet, uh, who are showing us all that um, action needs to happen now and, and gathering in the streets. Um, Declan has been involved in the movement since he was 13, uh, when he was, he was well aware at that age of the urgency of climate change um, and of inaction from the government. Um, and he says he is fighting for climate justice because our government has chosen not to care. Layla joined the school strikers six months ago, but she's been passionate about climate action and environmentalism since she was a child. Um, and she says that this work with the school strikes is a way for her to channel her frustration, anger, grief and anxiety into action. So thank you both so much for making the time to be here today. Um, Declan and Layla, I'll ask you both the same question and if you want to want to answer this and then I'll pass to the, you can pass to the other one. Um, but I want to know with young people, um, how does, you know, you're worried about the future that you're going to inherit. How does seeing climate inaction make you feel? Um, how does it impact your well-being? And do you see this in your peers as well? Um, I'll throw to Declan first. Okay, cool. Um, I suppose, like, from personal experience, other people have said this, but, like, climate, the climate crisis is, like, a mass trauma. And when you when you're faced with this like huge thing that sort of threatens I don't know everything you used to think of your future like how you thought it would be it's very easy to like feel very alienated and overwhelmed and dissociate yourself from that feeling and that experience because it's so huge and um I don't know it's sort of just like especially when you're in an organizing space you're sort of reminded like very often about just kind of how terrible our government is but I don't know for myself it's been important to confront those feelings and like put it into action I guess like organizing protests and I don't know yelling at the politicians and things like that it's sort of like a coping mechanism and I think that's the same for most people young people I've encountered in these organizing spaces um and yeah Layla? Um, for me, I think when I really, when I get into thinking about climate change, it can be incredibly like overwhelming and all consuming. Um, as someone who experiences anxiety, like just hereditarily, I think climate change just really adds on top of that and, exas and exacerbates it. Um, and so like, I already struggle with like catastrophizing and just naturally thinking the world is going to end. And then when I'm presented with facts that say that the world is going to end, I am kind of just like immobilized and like paralyzed by extreme feelings of anxiety and grief and just kind of even like despair. Um, and as for like my peers and for my friends, I went around and I asked them all today and I was asking them about it. And a lot of them said that they felt really insignificant and really powerless and even like commonly I got that they were felt like so anxious and overwhelmed that they just tried to kind of I guess ignore it which can kind of lead to like apathy and inaction 
where you're just kind of like paralyzed by this feeling. So it all feels so overwhelming that you can't even take any action at all, which I think really highlights the fact that this pressure should not be on children and it should not, like children and young people shouldn't feel like they are responsible for changing and trying to save the world um, because it's too much pressure for us. Um, I would say that I would think that everyone on this chat agrees that, yeah, that should not be on children. Um, 100%. Thank you both so much for sharing. Um, I'm actually going to come back to Di quickly. Um, Di also is a climate activist um, and um, works with other activists uh, a little bit older. So I just want to hear from you, Di, is that, uh, is, are those observations similar to what you've observed um, how is working on climate change activating the mental health of people who are a bit older? Yeah, absolutely. Um, the things that Declan and Layla said are so pertinent. Um, look, I think that there's a mixed, mixed impact on the um, activist mental health. So being with a group of people who understand what you're going through and are also working with you can have really protected, protective impacts. I think especially um, for people who are a bit older, but also for young people, because there's a lot, there's a lot of burnout. As Layla and Declan have both said, you become immersed in this space. It becomes all consuming. You're reading this stuff. It's an enormous burden of knowledge that we carry because we've read it. <clears throat> Excuse me. We understand what's going on and we're confronted with a public. Um, that doesn't seem to be aware of this or you're pushing up against resistance um, of big corporations, the police, the politicians, and that can be overwhelming. Um, but when you're with people um, who also are working on it, there is a sense of solidarity and energy and power that comes from being with others. But I've seen people burn out in grassroots organisations too, because um, there's incredible committed people who've put their all into it and lost their balance because it hasn't been sustainable. So I think it's, it can work both ways. Community of support and a sense of achievement that comes from working in a values dri driven space, especially for older people with others who absolutely understand and share the passions and the anxieties can be really supportive. I don't know if that's helpful. Oh, Di is so helpful yeah. and, a, and a great, um, what's the word, a great spiel to convince anyone here who wasn't sure if they should get involved in a climate action group to do so. Um, it is um, healing to be with people who feel the same way. Um, speaking of healing, so uh, thanks everyone for sharing those insights. Uh, we have a really good view of um, how climate change is affecting the mental health of people from other communities and how it's relevant in Brisbane um, and the Tiwi Islands and also from people contributing to the chat. Thank you for sharing your experience. Um, we want this to be, uh, we want this space to normalise how people are feeling. Um, and now to give you some ideas on how to cope better, uh, we really want you all to leave this session feeling more informed about the connection, but also feeling empowered and feeling like you have a few more tools in your belt to deal with it. Um, so I'd just like to remind everyone that there are avenues to seek help um, if you need it. Um, thank you, Sahela, she just popped them in the chat. Uh, so next, what we're going to move into is a eight minute video um, from a very experienced, psychologist called Susie Burke. She's going to go over some of the coping strategies um, and then we're going to go back to the panel and uh, get, their, get their take and then we'll have time for Q&A. So before I start the video, um, just a bit of background on Susie. So Dr. Susie Burke is an environmental psychologist, therapist, climate activist and parent living in central Victoria. Uh, the Australian Psychological Society, she developed resources on how to cope with climate change, how to raise children in a climate altered world, and also disaster preparedness and how to recover from disasters. She now works in private practice and runs sessions on this topic. Um, Susie couldn't 
join us live tonight, but we had this eight minute video of her speaking about these coping strategies at the previous event, um, which I'm gonna play. And I just want to flag as well, please keep putting questions in the chat. Uh, we are recording them. Um, great, so bear with me while I get Susie's video up. Uh, just gonna check, uh, put your thumbs up if you can see that. Great. And but it's worth taking a moment. Could you hear that? Awesome. Great. Let me take it back to the beginning. And I'll see you in eight minutes. I'm talking about coping with the existential distress of climate change or coping with climate change. But it's worth taking a moment just to think about what does coping actually mean. So coping is not just about how we manage uncomfortable or distressing feelings, which is often what we initially think coping is about. Coping is also about how we think, and it's also about how we respond to the thing that we're upset about. So the things that we do, um, you know, with our legs and our arms and our, and our mouths. So it's about feeling and it's about thinking and it's about doing. So this um, model that we use looks at these three types of coping strategies, they being emotion-focused coping strategies, um, problem focused coping and meaning focused coping strategies. So I'm going to go through each of them in turn. So um, emotion focused coping strategies, where what we're doing is we're um, con connecting and talking and sharing and talking about our feelings, uh, expressing our feelings as a way of being able to manage the distressing emotion. So emotion focused coping is about the things that we do to manage the uncomfortable feelings. And there's a whole host of things that that we can do and do do. So for example, one of the best ways in which you can manage an uncomfortable feeling is to move your body, to get active, to go for a walk, to go for a run, to shoot hoops, to, you know, to 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 um, raise your heartbeat, to take off a layer of clothes, to get sweaty. Um, and that's one way in which people can deal with uncomfortable feelings. But another one, of course, is to actually allow yourself to feel the feeling. And this will probably come up with a few different people uh, speaking tonight. But the thing is that the distressing and painful, uncomfortable feelings that we have about climate change are there for a reason. They're actually, it's actually a healthy and human response to be feeling that way that we do feel to a dangerous and very dysfunctional situation that we're facing in the world. And when we feel things deeply, it actually motivates us to then respond. And responding is, you know, one of the ways in which we take action to, to get out of this terrible mess. So noticing our feelings and allowing them and giving them space and allowing them to have their beginning and then their middle and their and then their end are all really important parts of um, being able to stay engaged with the problem of climate change. Because if we don't allow ourselves to feel the feelings, we um we risk um coming up with a whole lot of maladaptive coping strategies as a way of pushing away the feelings, which often involve switching off and not paying attention to the problem of climate change or distracting ourselves endlessly with what's the latest thing on Netflix. And all of these are also useful emotion focused strategies, but um, but, the, but they have their place. So one of the things that Maria Ojala found when she was doing her research with young people was that one of the preferred emotion focused coping strategies that young people use was distraction um, or minimising the problem. So getting themselves distracted with other things. And that is a fine strategy, but not if that's the only strategy that you're using. So we have to have a balance of, you know, at times being able to allow ourselves to feel these deep feelings. So the next one I'm going to talk about is the problem focused coping strategy. So these are the things that we do to deal with the problem that is actually causing the stress, which in this case is anthropogenic climate change. So that's anything that we do that mitigates climate change. So anything that's about sequestering carbon in the ground or reducing our carbon emissions. Plus, it can also be adaptation behaviours, but I'm still mainly interested in talking about mitigation behaviours, given that we have this narrowing window of opportunity to, uh, you know, utterly move ourselves away from a fossil fuel based economy. So when we talk about problem focused coping strategies, these being the things that we do with our legs and our arms and our mouths, when we talk to politicians, when we get out and we protest, when we, you know, dig holes and plant trees and all those sorts of things, we it's important to think about the difference between individual level behaviours and group level behaviours or collective behaviours or system system level behaviours, because whilst both are important. Um, there, the we always try to push people towards considering the value of the group 
um, or um, collective behaviour uh, or collective problem focused um, behaviours rather than the individual level behaviours. Because one of the things that we know is that if people are just focusing at an individual level, there's a risk then that a, it becomes a bit tokenistic. We can only think of so many things to do each day that are for saving the planet. And if what we've done is switched off all the lights as we left home and thought, oh, that's it, I'm off the hook now, I've done my bit for the planet, and all we did was actually turn our lights off, that's actually not really going to solve climate change. Whereas when we engage in collective behaviours with other people, we maximise our, our impact. Um, and, you know, we don't have time to just be all engaging in individual level behaviours. And I read one writer the other day who said that anyhow, a complete narcissistic focus on the self, i.e. just focusing on individual things that you can do in your own life, is actually not healthy. So I, I quite liked the idea that, uh, that that was another reason to, you know, move ourselves away from just doing the individual level household behaviours, even though they assuage our guilt and make us feel better, being problem focused coping strategies, Actually, as a climate activist, I'm always trying to encourage people to engage in those group level behaviours. And the other thing that we know as well is that if people do just involve in individual level behaviours, there's a risk that they end up feeling helpless and hopeless um, and miserable anyhow, because of course they know that that's not a way in which they can ever fully solve the problem of climate change. Uh, those sorts of things. But the last one that I'm going to leave you with um, is uh, the, the importance of being able to use our best thinking in order to come up with creative transformational ideas for how to solve the problem of climate change. And Rob Hopkins, who's the guy who started the Transition Town movement in the UK, has written a lot about this. And one of his recent books is called uh, What If? Um, from what if, what is to what if. So he's starting from, from what is, and he's using his imagination, writing us and looking at examples of people around the world who are using their imaginations to come up with creative, big societal level system, system change, because we can't use the same thinking that got us into this mess, which is sort of capitalistic, you know, using, extracting resources to get us out of this. It just it just won't work. And it, this is a ter terrific opportunity. And so often in the work that um, I do with groups and also with children, um, getting them to be uh, thinking um, in creative ways about um, solutions that can be transformative um, across all levels of society is a place of energy and engagement. And Rob Hopkins says that when we can imagine a different future and then we can tell stories about it, then that activates or it whets our longing and our appetite for it. And then we're much more likely to put our energy and our determination into making it happen. So uh, for those reasons, he really invites people to be continuing to be thinking about and imagining what is the different future that we're wanting to move into so that we can take steps to, to get there. So that's an example of mean focus coping strategy that keeps you in that sort of, okay, I'm still here, I'm still, I'm still working on this problem. Uh, I'm doing this tactic at the moment. So that's a brief summary of those different um, motion focus, problem focus and mean focused coping strategies according to the transactional stress and coping model. Um, oh, I've unmuted. Uh, sorry, just trying to get my stuff in order. Um, great. So that was Susie Burke. Um, I am a big fan of Susie. Um, and I hope that uh, you heard some interesting things in there. Um, what stood out to me was that there were several um, things that had already been mentioned to panellists that uh, she put into that model. And I was like, oh, Drawing the connection. So anyway, let's uh, get into a bit of a chat about how, how we move from having the problem uh, to how we can cope a bit better. Um, first, I might just pass to um, the mental health pros in the room, um, just for a bit of reflection on um, Susie's model. Um, I'll pass to Fiona first, if you've got any thoughts, and then I'll um, ask you, Guy. Yeah. Um Thanks, Remy. That's such a great video. It's the first time I've seen that video, and it, it's um, it, it's a great one. And I need to clarify that I'm a public health professional, and I'm not a clinician, so or a psychologist, um, in in any way, shape, or form. So 
my comments come from a sort of research public health perspective, but I think it's fantastic that we've got these um, frameworks that are, are being developed and are very solutions focused. And um, uh, I, I'd love to hear from Di on this as well after me perhaps, but um, it is great to see that these um, sort of solutions are being developed and are being actually more than developed, they're being implemented. And um, I think it's just the beginning and we need to probably find ways to scale up these approaches so that they're really quite widely accessible to um, people who are struggling as we see these impacts of climate change affect, affect more and more, um, more and more people. Thank you. Um, Di, I will throw to you and uh, would love to hear what stood out to you about what Susie said and, and mm. through your own work, um, what coping strategies have you found to be effective? Yeah, I think Susie's models, um, it's a really useful framework for thinking about what's happening and what we might do about it. You know, that triangle between our emotional responses um, and then our behavioural stuff. So I think it's always really important not to go straight to the actions and the solutions. We often forget that in our um, urges to make people feel better and to feel better ourselves. Let's just put the emotions aside. So with the sitting with the emotions, because I think Jonica Newby in her book, Beyond Climate Grief, um, there's a line in that that really resonated with me. It's about, she says, how do we have, I've written this down, how do we have, how do we live our best lives under the weight of this fearsome knowledge? And part of it is to be able to, you know, share it with other people, to be able to express the emotions, because I mean, we've, no, 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 he'll jump on you, Molly. Did you, did you guys have a cup? Did you guys have a chocolate? Oh, I did. Hey, sorry, yeah. guys, I'm just trying to find who that is. Is that you in the background, Di? No. Oh, sorry. Just <laughs> no, checking, I, guys. Yeah. I think that person's been muted. My apologies. Keep going. Somebody must have accidentally unmuted. Yeah. So, um, there's a lot of stories in this, but um, one thing that we began for a while was a climate cafe, which originated in the UK, I think, where people who were concerned about the climate and worried but hadn't connected with any groups could come in and have conversations, um, which weren't persuasive to try and recruit them, but just an opportunity to connect with others and to meet others and um, to take that first step into talking about the emotions that they were feeling. Um, and I think the, um, yeah, the action part of it's really important to, for those of us and Layla and Declan who are already in active. I mean, I think it was Declan that mentioned that it's really good to get out there and shout at the politicians and move your body and do things that help to reduce some of that emotional anxiety but normalising it as well. Mm. Thanks, Di. Mm. Thank you uh, for sharing. Um, I'm going to go back now to Suzanne. Um, just checking she's back. Great. Um, you spoke earlier about the impact of Santos's planned project on your community. Um, what do you see as the most important um, action to prevent these negative impacts on the social and emotional well-being of First Nations communities? Uh, thank you. I think the most kind of obvious one would be to not let them anywhere near our country. Um, I know that's really hard because you're dealing with big corporations that have like vested interests and financial gain, so it's a really challenging um, fight to fight, but it's an important fight as well. Um, so they, they, I've gone through their risk impact assessments and many of the strategies in place are still cause for concern because the appropriate mechanisms have not been implemented. Uh, there's risks of hydrocarbon spills, water contamination, tank collisions, noise and light pollution, scaring away marine life, among many of the other issues that this project uh, proposes. Um, you know, I think I've just been feeling really overwhelmed and lost for words really because there's just 
so much happening. Um, you know, and as mentioned previously, there's, you know, lots of young people are concerned about our future, um, you know, our children's future as well. So um, it's, it's a really kind of, yeah, um, overwhelming space. So everyone's already kind of shared the same kind of feelings on that. Um, but yeah, I think we kind of need support as well. We need to be raising awareness. We need people to be um, coming on board and understanding these impacts. You know, First Nations people have been looking after the country for since millennia. And I think it's time that we start investing research as well um, into this space to preserve um, our traditional and ecological knowledge, but I think that's um, it's really important to consider the um, the ownership rights and the ethical implications and um, you know working with communities to ensure that we are preserving our knowledge. And I think that's the best thing that we can really do at the moment is to um, is to hold on to this knowledge so that you know we can pass this down um, for, for, for generations to come. So um, yeah, I think that's one of the ways we can kind of help support um, long term. But I think uh, it's kind of hard for me to say how how to prevent the negative impacts, social emotional well being, because we're already dealing with um, a magnitude of social emotional um, mental health conditions as well. Like uh, this is a trigger warning for anyone, but. Um, back home on the TV islands, we had one of the highest suicide rates in the world. So I think it's really hard for me to focus on climate change. And I'm just being real when there's so many other um, factors that are affecting our communities as well. So I think everything really goes like hand in hand and we need to be addressing the root causes of these issues and um, finding solutions for them and then being able to build and um, build on the um, preserving um, and supporting, maintaining cultural knowledge and traditional practices. I think that's really important, the ability to, you know, go out on country, go fishing, um, spend the night at bush, disconnect from, from social media and everything. I know that's what I'm longing for. Like that's something I haven't been able to do necessarily being away from the country studying. I'm in Brisbane, but it's all worth it. Um, but yeah, I think, just um, from like a hierarchical perspective, um, research perspective, working with communities, making sure that um, our knowledge is being um, so support, yeah, supporting communities um, through preserving uh, land, land camp management practices. And there's a lot of work that's already going on in this space. Um, but yeah, I guess that's one of the kind of overarching ways we can help enhance um, mental health um, on communities. But there's, yeah, it's not an easy, an easy thing to address that easy. Thank you for sharing. Um, it's, yeah, it, it's already at the point where um, it can't, this project has gone ahead or at least it started and um, the consultation that needed to happen with First Nations communities didn't happen and it is having real impacts now. Um, again, I want to just make it clear to everyone that I'll have a chat with Suzanne and make sure that uh, I put in the follow-up email a way that you can help, whether it's um, if there's a campaign that is most helpful to get involved in because I think we've got to keep yeah. fossil fuels in the ground and we need to respect um, First Nations sovereignty of their lands. And just a quick little plug in, there's a protest next Tuesday at, um, or oh, where is it? Um, the Brisbane Convention Centre as well. So I've got a cousin that's coming down from Adelaide um, that's also speaking at Thank the event you. as well. So another two year long. So. Excellent. Yep, I'll include um, info of the rally as well. Um, thanks, Suzanne. Um, I'm going to go to Jess now. Um, Jess, as someone who sees the impact of climate change every day in your work, what do you do to remain hopeful? Thanks, Remy. Um, so I just wanted to pick up on uh, Suzanne's amazing um, knowledge and wisdom that she just shared, because I think for me that's a great source of 
hope and um, I have certainly learned a lot from First Nations value systems and I think Western society if we restructure that around those traditional Indigenous um, uh, value systems that really place people um, at the same level as you know e our ecosystems and our plants and our animals and our country our skies and waters we have custodianship of and we forsake these sort of narcissistic, um, egocentric behaviours that are really associated with capitalism. I think that that would really resolve a lot of issues. So I totally um, am completely subscribed to the importance of traditional ecological knowledge um, and raising those voices in the community. I just wanted to quickly share um, a coping mechanism, I guess, that I use. Um, I'm just going to share my screen. But this is such a great model. It's called the sphere of influence model. And it's really helped me because I really struggled to understand um, what I could, what was within my ability to control and to make healthy boundaries for myself um, for what I couldn't control. And I think sometimes we tend to overestimate, particularly as young people, I thought that it was my responsibility to stop climate change, to stop these big, you know, developments to stop um, biodiversity loss, and it's really not something that one person can ever achieve. So um, knowing what is within your control, which is, is actually very limited, it's your behaviours and your actions, essentially. You can't influence other people. Um, well, sorry, you can try and influence other people, but you can't control them. You can't control what other people, actors, corporations do in life. So it's focusing on what is within your control and getting a bit savvy about what is within your influence. And one thing that you can do is try and grow your sphere of influence. And that involves increasing your networks and it means getting involved in community organisations. Um, and for me, that has been one of the biggest, um, I guess, drivers of my uh, conservation of optimism um, rather than anxiety. I think there's so much that can be derived from connecting with like-minded individuals with shared values. And um, I think, I can't remember who picked up on it, it might have been Guy, but you really can amplify um, your influence. So sorry, my puppy's just barking at the moment. But um, just to share as well, um, for me, one of my biggest reasons for hope um, is completely captured in this picture and it's something that I draw upon all the time this exact image when I'm feeling a bit hopeless about conservation and climate change um, I attended this event I think back in 2019 um, in the Yarra Flats in Melbourne and um, here you can see Dr Jane Goodall who is um, an absolutely beautiful human um, who's dedicated to her entire life to sharing a message of hope about these issues and working particularly with young people. I'm sorry, excuse my dogs. Um, so in this photo, you can see um, Jane there. There is the funder on the left who supported this event. I'm pretty sure in the background, that's the Victorian Environment Minister. Um, we had the event open by a traditional owner in a smoking ceremony. We've got young university students and we had over a hundred primary school students and on this day, a whole community came together and they planted a forest. And this is what it looked like in a day. There's early volunteers. And this type of event just fills me with so much optimism, hope for the future, um, because it shows the power of people um, when they're working together on this problem. Um, and one great thing is that, you know, Nature is resilient, um, it can recover if we support it to, and these types of events are so effective, not just for nature itself, but for the every single individual attending there would have taken something from that, and I think that's incredibly powerful. So, um, yeah, I'll stop now, but <laughs> those are my reasons for hope. Thanks, Jessica. I haven't seen that sphere of influence before, and... Uh... Yeah, I definitely relate to the idea of um, drawing healthy boundaries between what you can and can't control. I'll be using that model. Um, thank you. Um, last but not least, um, we've got Layla and Declan, again, our school strikers. 
Um, I want to know what you guys see as being important in supporting the mental well-being of young people in a climate-affected world. And that, I guess, is how can encapsulate how you support yourself or how you support your peers, but also how you want the the people in charge or the adults in your life to support you. Um, I'll throw to Layla first this time. Um, yeah, thank you so much. Uh, I think like one of the most important things is just listening to kids and young people and making sure that they feel heard because, you know, I think it's hard enough to deal with all of these feelings that are caused by like directly, like you, the things you see happening around you. Um, like, you know, exactly which corporations are causing these problems and it causes all of this like emotional I guess turbulence but to then be kind of denied the right to even like feel those emotions in the first place and to be denied that validation um to even feel what you're feeling with people denying the existence of climate change even um and to kind of like ridicule you for feeling this way uh it's incredibly like disheartening and it's really sad so it's really really important to support and to validate young people's feelings surrounding climate change. Declan you want to add to that? Yeah I definitely agree with everything Lily just said. Um, I suppose you have to think of like also like the if we think about the bigger like overarching how do we solve these issues which I think is also very important to um other I don't know solutions sort of we really have to just go to I don't know what's causing climate change and we have to ask the questions like why why is profit so you know like prominent or whatever and why is that being placed above I don't know any empathy for people being affected by the climate crisis and I think if we care about people's mental health and everything else in these uh, I don't know like themes like climate change we have to think about those issues as well um and i think as well like on sort of temporary things i think well not really temporary but not so at the root of the issue anyway um i think c like connection and community i've always thought is like kind of like the driver of humanity and i think having a space where people can talk about these things like this um whatever we, this is um i think that's also very important because having people who understand what you're going through is for me personally has probably been like one of the biggest things to help climate anxiety and things like that thanks declan um yeah well that's exactly we, partially what we wanted to achieve at this space is helping people feel like this is not crazy to feel like this this is not um it's a really normal reaction to an existential problem and and you're not alone so um thank you for sharing and i hope that others are getting um a feeling of connection out of this and also people that they can continue that connection with um we're up to q a and we have had some um interesting chats happening in the chat box so thank you for that i also just want to thank everyone for sharing so many amazing resources um for some people who have come here today and maybe they haven't felt comfortable talking about climate and mental health before um there's loads of resources uh to pull on there but i will be sending an email tomorrow with some of um kaha's top picks um i just want to pull on something there's obviously been a big uh for anyone reading the chat a big geoengineering chat and this is definitely not the space uh for me to comment on the pros and cons of geoengineering but um people in the chat have um expressed some fear about it um and i think part of what that uh, i'd be really keen to hear from um others about this but I think part of what that pulls on is this idea that Fiona mentioned earlier of solastalgia, so the world around us changing, uh, sort of feeling like it's beyond our control and, and losing, um, you know, the sense of home that should belong um, to us in our place in the world, but because it is changing beyond recognition, we're losing that connection. So I wonder, Fiona, if you might... Um, 
just comment a lot, little bit on of what you know about solastalgia and then I'll throw it to anyone in the panel who wants to comment on that. Yeah, so the geoengineering thing is actually new for me, so I can't wait to hear what this is about. But um, if it relates to our, um, the human impact on the environment, the term solastalgia actually is um, quite a, well, I won't say an old term, but it, it, it's a relatively older term which came from probably the more anthropological um, space. Albrecht was his last name. Um, and it relates more to the loss of connection to land and they um, grief for more than grief, but it, it relates directly to a loss of connection to place and land, which has obviously now become incredibly relevant in the context of climate change where we are seeing forced migration, people being driven off their land and sea level rise, what have you. So that's why solar nostalgia has entered the climate change discussion today, but it actually existed way before. Um, maybe some of the, while we're talking about it, some of those other terms that have kind of come about as well, there's eco-anxiety and eco-grief and there's climate anxiety and really, um, they, uh, to me, they're a little bit self-explanatory, but they reflect this um, evolution in the changing environment, human impact on the environment narrative. So eco-grief is around, and it can be a very individual thing, um, not necessarily related to climate change, but again, it becomes incredibly pertinent and relevant in the climate change discussion, is around loss of um, ecology, of nature. It might be more related to land clearing or, you know, I, I don't actually know, but I suspect that term is probably in, in its origins really linked to, to land clearing, mass land clearing and loss of ecology. Um, uh, eco-anxiety and climate anxiety used interchangeably, but the more um, um, kind of recent, more accepted, more used term is climate anxiety, but you can imagine that eco-anxiety is more related, again, to those ecological changes. So I just I hope that's like a little 101 and yeah. probably other people have... Uh, and, there's a, and there's a bunch of other, other terms, but they're probably the key ones. No worries. Um, I'm actually going to, on that point, just throw to Suzanne before I move to another question, because Suzanne has spoken about um, the loss of connection to land, and this is obviously um, more pertinent uh, to First Nations people than, um, than for the rest of us. So, Suzanne, could you comment on that? Does that resonate with you, um, what Fiona was just talking about? Um, yeah, I think the one thing that I did want to add um, when they're just talking about anxiety and not feeling like, you know, there's this whole theme of feeling hopeless and in despair and, you know, we're afraid. But I think um, drawing on a couple of the key points, um, I, so I apologise, I forgot who's mentioned the, um, the strategies that we can implement. I think it's also really important to not forget the importance of just disconnecting from social media, disconnecting from all of these things that we, you know, we live in such a digitalized world where we are bombarded and exposed, exposed to so many, um, you know, bad news or whatever it is, not bad news, I don't know if that's a term, um, <clears throat> but there's just, I think it's really important, um, a practice that I need to start implementing more as well is just disconnecting going for walks like there's in Brisbane we're so lucky to have beautiful um environmental centers and those you know um the, the the bush trails and just hiking and I think um I can't really speak on um you know I've, I I I can't really speak on the questions that you've asked because that's not my kind of lived experience um but I think for me um when I am being able to go back home and able to go back on country, I think that's one of the most like healing and grounding things for me. And um, I'm sure everyone has their way of, you know, on the weekends going to the beach, like these little things that just make such a huge difference in our own 
mental health and well-being, and I think that's really important not to forget um, that we can just yeah, disconnect and go for a walk, take our shoes off, ground, you know, that, yeah, so I think that's important. Thank you for sharing. Um, I'm going to go to a question from, well, it wasn't really a question, but uh, a comment from Bill, and I want to draw something out of it. Um, he said, I hate to stereotype, but I think it's still the case that many males are not good at talking about their feelings. Um, and he says it might be better suited to other coping strategies. I might throw to die. Um, there is, you know, plenty of evidence that... Um, some men particularly, I mean, definitely applies to both genders, but men more so uh, feel uncomfortable talking about their emotions. Um, do you have any advice about that and what coping strategies might be most appropriate? Oh, that's a really good question. Yeah, um, definitely that's something that is, is much more difficult for men generally than women. Um, I think for men, maybe it's more about talking about what you can do going into the doing strategies rather than the, the feeling strategies. So what is it that's going to make you feel more comfortable at the moment? What are you noticing about what's happening for you? And what would it be that's going to help? And um, working with that person to figure out what it is that they might be able to do. Remy, could you tell me the first part of that question again, please? Yes, sorry. So um, Bill said he doesn't want to stereotype. It's still the case that many males are not good at talking about their feelings. Yeah. Basically, yeah. yeah, what other coping strategies um, yeah. would work? Yeah. So, yeah. So being able to get outside, do things, join in um, other activities that are being run by other um, organisations. Like I noticed in the back of Suzanne's um, background there, there was a together, like a Climate Action Now sign. And that is something that the Australian Conservation Foundation is doing across the entire width of Australia at the moment. Um, this idea that if we all work together, then we can achieve something. So maybe being able to link into something like that, where there's a group of people who are, you know, being very active. And um, thank you. Yeah. I might just throw to Fiona, who's got her hand up. Yeah, thanks. I just. On that note about um, men and how they um, uh, respond emotionally to the impacts of climate change, I just thought I'd share a little bit of research that we've done very recently out in the Darling Downs area. And that's obviously a very rural area. It's largely agricultural. And we ran a number of um, um, stakeholder consultations, speaking with local people, various organisations, and um, we just got this overwhelming narrative about, because it's an agricultural area, it was large, the study was largely kind of by virtue of the location um, focused on farming and agriculture. And we just got this overwhelming narrative about how um, men, and this is not related to um, any sort of, views or opinions about whether climate change is real or not real, we're talking about the impacts of, of drought and other weather events, um, that men just don't want to, and of course this is a generalisation, don't want to um, talk about emotions. If they can fix their fence and they can um, harvest their crop, everything is okay. But their mental health is so intimately tied with the land and the success of um, having a productive um, season. It, I just found it so interesting that, and, you know, I know that's one, it, but it's an important group of men here in Australia. It's really important because we've seen suicide rates go up and up and up in this um, population, and it's been largely unexplored. And I think it just is maybe interesting for those of us who are sitting in a, in a metropolitan area and uh, kind of saying, oh, yeah, men, men don't like to talk about their emotions. Yes, no, they don't like to talk about their emotions. But actually, maybe for men, it sort of links into what Di is saying. Maybe for some men, the, the solution is not necessarily talking about emotions. It's about a feeling of control and being able to, to, to do their, their job. 
it's more of a reflection than anything and I can see Di's got something to say on that. Yeah. yeah, I'll let you respond quickly, Di, and then I've got a couple more questions I want to get through. Yeah, sorry about that. Yes, I totally agree with Fiona. And so I've, I omitted that something I usually find really helpful when working with men is not to go straight to the emotion, but talk about the brain and how those parts of our brain, um, the fight, flight, freeze system and how we're flooded with cortisol and it creates those sensations in the body. And for men, that seems to be a really easy way to then connect with what's going on inside of them. Um, and then they're able to talk about the impact that the stress has had on them. So that's just a quick comment there. Thanks, Ty. Um, I hope that's been enlightening for listeners. Um, I have a question for the young people on the panel, um, particularly Declan and Layla, but um, uh, anyone can answer that they want. Um, several people here tonight and people in the chat have said, that they see young people as one of their big reasons for hope. And I just want to ask, how does this make you feel? Is that a lot of pressure? And, and what, rather than, I guess, seeing you as a reason for hope, like is that a way you like to be framed or would you prefer to be sort of framed in another way? Curious. Um, I'll go first. Uh, I guess I kind of just feel... A little bit kind of deeply underqualified to be any sort of role model or any sort of person who can uh, inspire people. I mean, I'm very grateful to be in this position and I'm really glad that I can give other people hope, but I don't know. I, don't know. I have no idea what I'm doing at all. Um, I think, especially in a lot of the, I guess, work, a lot of like the roles I take on within School Strike, it feels very distant from actual like climate justice and climate action because a lot of it is making friend calls and inviting people to strikes um and it can become a little bit uh, I don't know it can come very easy to become burnt out and to feel like you're not really making the impact but yeah I don't know I'll go to Declan and then I have a quick response, but, and I'll just open up to anyone else on the panel who wants to respond. But Declan, do, do you, what do you think? Do you think it's reasonable when people say you're their reason for hope or what do you think? Um, I'm speaking totally from, sorry if you can hear my sister. I am <laughs> speaking totally from personal experience here, but like, I feel like a lot of, most of the pressure to do activism comes from like within myself rather than um, adults. So for me, I don't feel so much pressure from other people to can you continue doing these things more than from myself sorry um but it's also very understandable because when you're outside of something it's easy to look in and have this sort of illusion of it being sort of better or than it is and i guess in this sense more exciting and powerful and when you look at us protesting rather than seeing like the anger and despair that went into it beforehand Thanks, Declan. I'll throw to Jess, who has her hand up. Oh, I can't hear you. Can you go again? Can you hear me? Yes. Um, Declan, you just made some really great comments. Um, this is such an interesting one because I have been so concerned about this for a long time. Sorry, Jess, you're actually um, falling in and out. Um, I really, I'll, you go. I'll go and then I'll just jump to you if, you, if, it, if it works a bit better. Um, I just want to say um, that was actually my question because I'm really curious about it, which is a bit, um, bit self-centred. But um, I just want to say that that is exactly, like I've heard Greta give a really similar response, that it's actually not fair to put the pressure on her to solve the problem. She wants the adults in the room to use the science that's available um, and make the decisions for the people who don't have the power, the young people. So um, it, it's very much, um, I think it's really important for adults to not, I think it's really inspiring what the young people are doing. And I think it is hopeful that the next generation of people who will be in power will have this really different view. But I also think it's really important that you think about what 
adults can do here and now because this is the important decade and it's not sort of seeing that these kids will take control and fix it all. Um, they really need you to then take your power and make sure that the solutions that we have already are implemented. Um, Jess? Romeo has nothing to add. You said it better than I've ever thought. Oh, that is very flattering. Um, thank you. Um, okay, well, last question. Um, I don't want to get political uh, because it's a very political time. Um, people, of course, have been talking about uh, the election in the um, chat. Um, and Kaha does have a scorecard, which I will send out to people um, tomorrow in our email that I've talked way too much about. But um, I think someone, a few people have asked, like, why hasn't this, um, why isn't it the number one issue? Or why are people not voting on this? Um, I don't think we'll, uh, oh, now I'm confused what I'm trying to say. Um, so what, what I'd like to know is just with this moment, um, not sort of telling people who to vote for, um, because I think we need to make climate change as nonpartisan as possible and being partisan has been one of the big problems in this movement. But I might just throw to everyone on the panel, you know, what does this election mean to you for climate change and um what are you hoping to see out of the next government um, to address the fact that this is really distressing for people that you know and people in your communities? Um, I might start with Di, if that's okay. Yeah, thank you for asking, Remy. That's such a good question. Um, the Australian Conservation Foundation has done a couple of big surveys recently and the most recent one that came out says that 67 percent of Australians believe that um, the benefits from taking greater climate action outweigh any costs involved and 69 percent of them think it would increase the Australian strengthen the Australian economy and that it's a voting issue so what I'm hoping is that people are going to go to the polls and they're going to look at how their selected politician or party vote on climate and they're going to make a judgment based on climate and I'm hearing a lot of people say they've had enough and they really want change because they're super worried about our future so I'm fingers crossed <laughs> thank you thanks Di uh, I'll go to Jess I have a slightly different view on this probably because I work on policy but I am less interested in Jess, sorry, I was getting you for a bit, but it just um it just flacked out again. Really sorry. Do you want to maybe just like write it in the chat oh, and yeah. yeah. I'm sure it was really profound though, so thank you. Um, I'll throw to Fiona next. Uh, so I might take a slightly different angle on this and talk about what we know about um, climate and health policy and climate and mental health policy. And that um, we really, in this country, we know, we know that we, we don't have good climate, well, we probably don't really have any decent, climate policy, um, we don't have any good climate and health policy and we have virtually zero, zero um, climate and mental health policy. In any relevant policy documents in this country, we are not thinking about mental health impacts, social emotional wellbeing, wellbeing of our populations. It is just completely absent. So um, I, I'm not going to sort of, I, I, you know, in that respect, I can't really talk about any political um, past judgment on any um, political party. But if there was any political party who came to me and said, Fiona, we really believe that mental health is absolutely critical to be thinking about in the context of climate change, they would be getting my vote. Thanks, Fiona. Um, I think Suzanne has dropped off, so I will give um, Declan and 
Layla an opportunity um, because they don't get to vote. Um, And so they want us to do a good job for them. Um, Noting that you can't tell anyone who to vote for, what should people be thinking about uh, when they go and vote, Declan, when it comes to climate change and mental health in young people? Um, From my perspective, I guess, as someone who can't vote and won't be able to vote till the next election, I think people tend to sort of forget about issues and then like three years later when the election comes, they, oh, remember them. But I think for like School Strike for Climate and other like youth activists, we really want to grab people during election time and get them to know that voting isn't the only thing they can be doing and they should be doing things and thinking about these things and like, like as much as they can without falling apart, like uh, during non-election periods and when there's time for protesting and other things that don't involve political parties or things like that. So I guess what I would want everyone to know is that it's just as important to vote, in my opinion, than it is to, as it is to organise and talk to your peers and things like that outside of election. Thanks, Declan. Layla? Um, yeah, hi. I really loved what Di was saying in terms of the positives um, outweighing the negatives in terms of kind of phasing out things like coal and fossil fuels and switching to renewable energy because I do think that the government has the power to um, like switch our economy so we aren't reliant on coal and it's kind of really disappointing to talk to people even people my age who kind of don't even really believe that it's plausible um, to stop mining coals and to stop being reliant on that. Um, uh, yeah, but I do think that it is possible. And I think that if the government actually just put in that effort and made that switch and facilitated that and made sure that people were supported enough, then it is definitely possible. Thanks, Layla. I'll just quickly read out Jess's response. Um, She's less interested in political change than a shift in community attitudes. Um, Regardless of the political party, ministers and members have responsibilities and a willingness to take action on the critical issues in their electorate. So get vocal and connected with your local member to achieve better outcomes for climate change in the environment. That's great. Um, Being civically active, uh, as Declan said as well, outside of of the very sort of vicious electoral cycle is a really good idea um that's all we've got time for and in fact i'm three minutes over i'm really sorry um i'm really excited for you guys to get back to your families um or go out or whatever it is that you're doing tonight um but thank you so much to all of you uh for joining us taking the time and being so flexible with the event moving and all sorts. Um, Thank you to the Queensland Centre for Mental Health Research and the Australian Psychological Society for helping us at the Climate and Health Alliance to put this event on. Um, As I've said several times, we'll be sending an email around with a lot of this stuff. So um, if if something stays in your brain, um, you'll get an email with it 